And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet. And I just completely fucked up my intro because this is not the monastery, this is Geek Watch. I am still <laughs> working on it. Hey, hey, hey. I've been, I've been doing that particular intro for like three years now, so cut me some fucking slack. I would, well, except last time I, I think last time I was here, you still did that. Yeah, I'm still... I'm st I'm still tr I'm still trying to figure out an op an opening slogan for Ge for um Geek Watch that's on that's on the same level as what I as what I did for the monastery ones, calling it Geek Watch the subsidiary of the monastery um felt a little bit too wordy, um. But it is it is August it is August twenty third. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two of my good good brothers here in the here in the Geek Watch. We have the eye the eye of Sa the eye of Sauron, the uh, the unofficial man at arms of, of the watch, and the and the and the man who has to who had who had to suffer from who had to suffer steamed caps earlier this week. Um, good brother Doku, and we and we have. The man, the man of a th the man of a thousand interviews, and the and the and the man who who ha who um who has his who has sleeping pills nick nicknamed um ghost backstory. <laughs> Good brother shades, how the fuck are we doing tonight? Uh, excuse the man of a thousand interviews. This coming from you, motherfucker. You did it first. <laughs> Yeah, I had to do mine over several years. You've gotten no near that amount in just the last year alone. Don't even try that shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm doing well. Okay, there's been some family stuff going on that I talked about before the record before this recording. But uh, yeah, let's just say I kind of need an escape right now. Mm -hmm. So. Last, well, the, week, uh, last week we wrapped the one up. Escape you don't need, the one escape you don't need is uh, Madoka. <laughs> don't you fucking start. <laughs> so last time we last time we we uh, came, we came together, it was it was to wrap up the um, tabletop themed episode with the world building experiment. Now this week this week. Because of the fact that the topic list is on a fresh start, I spun the wheel. It landed on anime, so we are going to be discussing a little something that I have had on the on-off back burner, or whatever you want to call it, for months. I call it A Tale of Two Deconstructions. Specifically, we will be, dis we will be discussing Neon Genesis Evangelion and Puella Magi Madoka Magica in this regard. Because both of them are deconstructions of two separate genres. But before we delve into that, I think we should nail down what makes a deconstruction a deconstruction. And obviously, um, pretty, Doku, I'm pretty sure the first thing that's coming to mind for you is um, Watchmen, specifically the comic, because, how that because of how that was a deconstruction of the, sup of the superhero comic um, at the time. Yeah, it. <clears throat> I don't know if I would call Watchmen a deconstruction. It, I'm only calling it that because Alan Moore did. So there you go. Well, Alan Moore can call it whatever uh, whatever he wants. Uh, he's wrong. It. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a deconstruction. I would call it. <sighs> well, let's be blunt. It's it's still it's still a superhero. I think uh, what you're looking for, Doku, is that Watchmen would be more of a unfunny satire. Maybe it, black comedy. I, to be blunt, I would call it realistic. Um, well, that's kind of the aspect of a deconstruction to begin yeah. with, is that 
you're taking the tropes, cliches, and common elements of a particular genre, and while I wouldn't say putting it into the real world per se, I would say putting it into more realistic circumstances. Yeah. Like, what would really happen if people, you know, in the case of Watchmen, if we, there were superhero vigilantes trying to protect the city? Yeah. Well, when I say realistic, what I mean, and I'm sure we'll get into this, when I say realistic, it's realistic for the reason that it doesn't it doesn't look at the genre in the sense that it has this grandiose uh, uh, vision of I'm going to be the greatest thing in the world. Like, no, no, you're not the, This world that you're in, uh, the role that you play. It's realistic in the sense that this is how you're going to fit into this world. And well, it's, it's kind of dark. It, you're, you're not, you know, it's not a shonen. It's not, you're, you're not Deku from My Hero Academia. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Now, for me, the for me the idea of a uh, of a de of a deconstruction in some in some regards is taking is take is taking the motifs the for lack of a better word tropes within that within that particular um, genre and either either turning them either turning them on their head doing the whole what would it be really like although I think that's a um but that's a bit of a slippery slope to cynicism in some cases or or um or uh, or taking or taking them apart and and revealing some of the flaws that are t that again are taken for granted um is now in the you know, in the case of um, in our particular case evangelion is Argued to be a deconstruction of the super robot genre. Um, I've all, my buddy uh, now uh, JT has said that um, there's a bit of Ultraman deconstruction in that. I um, I'd say I'd say I'd say somewhat, but a lot, but a lot of the narrative motifs within it, I think lean I think lean more towards the towards the kind of um, Go Nagai era super robot than. Um, anything in the Ultra series. I mean, the closest I can come up with the within the Ultra series is some of the monster designs and the whole three-minute time limit when you don't when you don't have a battery when piloting Ava. That's um. Yeah, that's it's a, a stretch. Couple of bullet points. It's it. I'm not. Um, I'd say it's. I'd say that's more of him being inspired by Ultraman because. Um, Hideaki Anno is a very, very passionate flag bearer for Tokusatsu, to the point of setting up a museum for it. Now, ma now, um, the uh, now the other end of the spectrum, Puella Magi Madoka Magica, um, and I know somebody's gonna get on me for the pronunciation after the fact. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Moving on. That is very much in the, a deconstruction in the uh, magical girls um, genre, and the thing is, I will I will freely admit that I ended up jump I ended up jumping on on the original anime solely on the strength of who was involved with it, because ah yes it was animated by Shaft. You had you had musical um stuff. Motifs from, um, I believe, Kajura, and I'll always yep, appreciate a chance when Kajura gets to gets to um, escape from Sao Hell. <laughs> and of course, the writer, the, the 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 man, the myth, the legend himself, Gen Urobuchi, or for those who know him in those circles, the Uro Butcher. Although, um, I'd actually I'd actually say as time as time has gone on. Orobuchi has dialed himself back. Yeah, but this was during that time where the title was very apropos, mm -hmm. all things considered. This was like peak Orobuchi. Yeah. Um. But it, I think 
I have to wonder if you. I have to wonder if you looked at if you looked at um, what what happened to people like Frank Miller and said, "I don't want to be that." <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about that last night, weren't we? <laughs> yeah, last night we last night Shades and I were um were were watching to were watching Toonami, and they had part two of the Dark Knight Returns, and I um now putting aside the fact that I had to make the Miller time joke, um. There's also there is also the fact that I I made a fascinating little contrast because Frank Miller back in his, back in his early days in the '80s and to a less to a certain extent the '90s he was a decent writer like The Dark Knight Returns is a good story Batman Year One is a good story Daredevil The Man Without Fear was a good reintroduction of um, Daredevil I think the problem is he. Because of the fact that he did a lot of he did a lot of material with um, dark, dark, almost noir esque subject matter, and a thing about film noir is it is inherently cynical, since it's a response to um, pe- to um, post World War One post World War One mindsets, and he didn't have anything to really balance him out. And around the same time, I found out that when he's not writing horror comics. Junji Ito is a complete goofball. <laughs> like you, you look at the, you look at the, you look at photos of him and the way he acts in real life, or <laughs> when he's hanging out with other creators, and it's a very far cry from the content that he writes about. Yeah, and I, and and that, and trust me when I say, folks, like, and we're gonna, I'll tie, I'm gonna help tie this back into mm-hmm. Evangelion here in a minute because I think I think this goes a long way to explain a lot of Evangelion, but the reason why you need to have that that the idea of just letting loose, having fun when you're not working on something like like Junji Ito or Frank Miller did, is if you're always trapped in that serious, dark, cynical mindset without anything to balance it out you will eventually be swallowed into that abyss. And we saw that with Frank Miller because 9-11 happened. And of course he lives, he, he is a New Yorker through and through. And what happened from there broke him. And we see that in his work with everything post 9-11, like all-star Batman and Robin. And of course the infamous Holy Terror. Mm-hmm. And, Oh, and um, also, also the whole the Dark Knight Strikes Again, which um, not which when you consider the ending for the Dark Knight Returns, makes me even. I said before, it makes me even more angry. Yeah. Now, in the case of in the case of some of something like even get in the case of something like Evangelion, um, you already have a you already have a very. A very a very dark a, pr- a very dark um approach. Given the fact that you're you're effectively dealing with the last bastions of, de- of defense against these, um against these almost eldritch like angels. Well, I would say eldritch like, but when you consider a- when you consider angel art over over the years, um, it's not that weird. No, but then you also got to look at its its creator Hideaki Anno. Mm-hmm. And where his mindset was at the time of the original Evangelion's creation. And he was also not in the right frame of mind at that time. I believe he had lost uh, his mother not long prior, if I remember correctly. And again, that kind of grief can break a man. Now, obviously, I would say Hano has somewhat recovered since then. But at that time, he was still trying to go through all that. And here he is writing a very dark, twisted, cynical series. And you can clearly see in the final product how that broken mindset affected the final product. Mm-hmm. I, th- I, think another point of, I think another point of contrast in that is... Um... Is Hironobu Sakaguchi, since you br- since you brought up death in the f- death in the family when it came when it came to that? Yes, and I know exactly where you're going with this. Yeah, shortly after Final Fantasy VI was released, he he um what well, he was he um 
his mother had passed away. And that ended up playing a factor into some of the into some of the creation conceits and concepts that he put that he put forward in 7. Um I think I think what's I think what stopped him is the fact that um even though there's plenty of even though there's plenty of darkness within 7, I would not consider 7 a dark work. Now, there was still plenty of lighthearted moments. I mean, you've got the the infamous uh cloud cross-dressing thing which was very much done in f- just for fun and you get you know you got stuff like the uh the big casino i mean i'm not I'm, it's been a while since i remember the names but uh, like you saucer. had the gold saucer thank you you know you still had a lot of light-hearted moments sprinkled throughout so it was clear that while it definitely had affected sakaguchi it hadn't broken him mm-hmm. so he was able to work through that grief and actually channel it into his work and I think Anno tried to do the same thing with Evangelion, but failed miserably because his mind, he was so heartbroken, he just couldn't focus. And that explains a lot because the first three episodes of Evangelion, and I was actually, funny enough, I was just watching uh, reviewer Bennett the Sage and his reviews of Death and Rebirth and End of Evangelion. And mm-hmm. while obviously we won't be talking about those tonight, they do his look into Ano and Ano's mindset really paints a picture for you. In that, the first three episodes before all uh, before his mother had passed, or before he had gotten the news, was really good. Like he was, it was, it was showed a lot of attention. I think that's where a lot of the hook came from for most people: the mm-hmm. fact that it was something big. But then that happened. And you could see the downward spiral as the series goes on, as the series starts to go further and further into just utter insanity. Now, I have he- I have seen some some people make comparisons between some of the, the big the big thing that for me undoes the undoes the whole the whole idea of it being a deconstruction is in the, is in the fact that. Ano got way too tied up in his own mythos, and some of that mythos was integrating elements from, um, to, from 2001 and its successor, and maybe and to and to a certain and to a certain degree, some of the things that um fo- that followed up on it. Especially, especially I would say 20, especially I would say 2010, which is kind of weird. <laughs> like even after all. If, 2001: A Space Odyssey. Um, even though there's some elements that are that are a bit strange, you can wrap you can wrap your head around a, a bunch of it, which I think is the reason it's better remembered. But its sequel, 2010, gets into some more esoteric approaches. That d- it's one it's one of those cases where some sometimes the answer to the mystery is worse than the mystery itself. And of course, you can't really have that when you're do. Think about the th- let's think about the conceit of Evangelion on paper. You have you you have the you have these otherworldly beings known as angels that com- that completely decimate the earth. You've you've got the you got to the point where um, Japan is in this perpetual summer phase. Um. The main the main line of defense is effectively a synthetic life form that's lobotomized and controlled, and with and within that further mysteries about about the creatures and the and the whole process of an organ how an organization like Nerve can can even exist, and though and those are those are compelling mysteries to unravel. When they finally are unraveled, they end up leading to more mysteries, and the and the and the and the answer to those mysteries just leads to more questions. There's a right and a wrong way to do that kind of thing, and it's a very very delicate tightrope to walk. But not the ha- kind of thing you want to do when you're in the kind of mindset Anna was in. Yeah, you have the thing. The thing is with that is that you have to make the journey worth it. I know. I know a lot of people do the whole spiel about. It's not the journey; it's the destination. That's not true. That's not entirely true. Let me let me clarify. 
Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, it's not entire. It's it's partly there, but again, it, it's a case of the journey and the destination have their equal values. Mm-hmm. The journey you have to feel like the journey the journey was good, and then you have to feel like it was worth going through that. And that's something that Evangelion started off the journey good, mm-hmm. but then it fl- it stumbled and then fell flat on its ass. And the ending shows that. Now, I do want I do want to I do need I do feel like I need to address a bit of the a bit of the elephant in the room regarding the character of um, Shinji. And um, first off, let me get let me give my my sincere condolences to Spike Spencer. <laughs> who has made it very clear over the years that he does not care for that character. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it is the character he is pretty much exclusively known for. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, ultimately the the prompt the now when you look at the way um the way the way Shinji acts in those first 3 episodes. Like even it, even when it comes to his even when it comes to his whole his whole whininess it it isn't at extremes um which would be a, which would be a problem late which would be a problem later on like the there is there is a ver, at the very you can at the very least rationalize why he would be why he would be hesitant about everything because he's just being thrown right into the middle of the, of this whole thing with no clue on what to do yeah, and even in later, even as the series goes on, like, again, going back to Bed at the Sage again real quick, he, he points out something I think that I agree with wholeheartedly. Shinji Ikari is not a character you're supposed to like at all. You're never supposed to like the guy. You're not supposed to even relate to the guy. But when you look at the bigger picture, his interactions with his father, the circumstances he's thrown in, and everything else... He is supposed to be a character you can understand. You can understand why he is so uh, such a coward. You can understand why he's so hesitant to get involved in this fight. The problem is that they push it so hard that it become he it, his whole story becomes about him not realizing that sometimes you just kind of put shit aside for what's going on. You know, yes, you've got a shit life, dude, but uh, look around you. So does everybody else. The world's about to come to an end. You might want to put your personal bullshit aside just long enough to make sure the world didn't blow up. Then we can deal with your shit. The, 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 other, the other really big problem with this, and this is something that other people have pointed out, is the fact that that is the fact that the people around him had had more had more of an arc than he did and one one could one could ar- one could um ar- one could argue that there was the, that there were the beginnings of the arc when it comes to his relationship with ray but but um the problem is he's essentially static and now a char- now I'm not saying that every character needs to have an arc I've in the past, defended the idea of a pulp character that it that is that is meant to be this inflexible point that everything happens around them. Um, a couple a couple examples of that are Goblin Slayer and Judge Dredd. Well, when Judge Dredd is written competently, we don't talk about the Stallone movie. <laughs> it's great for memes. It's not a it's not a good Dredd movie. Go watch the go watch the urban version and and thank me later. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he, but the fact that the fact that he's basically the same person, the same person throughout, even a, even after even after getting getting uh, having connections with other people, which you would think would have some degree of ch- some degree of change to him, it do- it um doesn't. Aside from aside from some of the more exaggerated reactions, especially the whole thing with meeting um. Pun meeting um <laughs> pen pen for the first time. <laughs> yeah, like literally, it's not until the very last episode 
the very last moment of the last episode, in fact, where he finally has a change, but it's so drastic. It's like a full 180, and it's literally at the last scene. By that point, who the fuck cares anymore? And when it and when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the support that supporting cast each of them each of them does have like i said each of them has more of an arc than than the others do and yes yeah, so some of those arcs end up go, end up going very very badly for them but they but there's a, there's a at the very least a feeling that you've gone on some degree of a journey and Keep in mind, by no means am I saying that you need to have some sort of happy ending because, ob obviously, you're not obviously when doing apocalyptic fiction, you're not going to have that. But you at least felt like you t you took some degree of movement. Um, there's a galaxy of difference between activity and movement in storytelling. So in that regard, I think I could I think I could say that with Shinji, there's a lot of activity, but there's no movement. Also known yeah. as Abram's disease. <laughs> yeah, because when you look at the you look at everything, like Shinji does a lot throughout the series. You know, he steps up. He's usually the one that saves the day in a lot of those episodes. But when you look at him as a character and how he's progressed, truth be told, he hasn't. Like literally, he is as whiny and cowardly in episode 25 as he was in episode one. Mm -hmm. And that is why he's, he's, there's no movement because you don't see him get better. You don't see him deal with those issues. They make it look like he's dealing with those issues with, with scenes where him and his father are at his mom's grave. But we literally with seconds later, it's right back to where he was before. And you can't do that. You have to show that he's learned from those. Hell, Asuka, the, the quintessential Sundare bitch, shows more movement by the end than Shinji does. And when it... And when it comes to... When it comes when it comes to that that um, particular cast, some something else I do something else I do think should I do think should be pointed out is is get, getting back to this whole deconstruction thing. The um, it's it is no debate that the father of what we refer to now as the super robot genre is Go Nagai. In fact, in fact, he in fact, in my personal opinion, he's he's one of the three gods of manga. Mm -hmm. Um the the others be the others being of course of course te of course Tezuka and um Ishinomori. I know somebody might say but didn't he do most of his stuff with Tokusatsu? He was more of, he was as much of a, he was more of a pioneer with with manga first. Cyborg 009 anybody? I was going to go with, I was going to go with the one two punch, both that and the Skull Man. Ah, fair enough. Cuz fair argument. <laughs> that w because yeah, that I double checked. That did beat the Punisher by a few by a few years. So it is technically the first anti-hero. Yep. And when you now, when it comes to the super robot, the super robot genre, that that he that he pioneered, the two that come to mind of, for a lot of people are going to be Mazinger and Getter Robo. Hmm. And. In a lot of those, in both of those cases, while while they've certainly had some darker turns over the years, you have a protagonist in both of them that is very proactive. And contrastly, Shinji is a reactive protagonist, which I think only further adds to that frustration of not developing. Yeah, he just does whatever. He just reacts to whatever's going on around him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't step up, and sometimes it takes him a while for even him to react to anything. It takes like an ungodly force of mo of motivation for him to even get into the fight most of the time. 
And usually, usually, it, usually it's 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 when he's in a position where he's forced to. Um, or you or you have situations where where he where um where he where he doesn't have any other option but to but to fight otherwise someone else will suffer. Hell, that was the sole re that was the sole reason he ended up being compelled to even get even get on the um Ava in the first place. Yeah. Because if he didn't do it, they were gonna have Ray do it, and um she was in no condition to even move anywhere. Say the least. I mean she was literally in a hospital bed, barely like brandaged up and barely able to walk. Mm -hmm. It was only then that he finally was like, Oh, if, if I don't go, she's gonna go and she can barely even stand. How's she gonna pilot a fucking robot? Yeah. Now when now when it comes to what and you would think and one would one would think that um that ha that having having effect having a f of, of arguably a bad a bad parental figure in someone like Miss Sato might um might help might help adjust these kind of things that it really it really doesn't like the like the fact that the, the fact that they're living in the same place um doesn't doesn't really doesn't really it's i guess the way i can describe it is it's like there's 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 abbott but there's no costello yeah because that's in in a normal circumstance that's the kind of thing you that's the kind of thing you'd have you've had you've had you'd have one person who's the crazy and one person who's the straight man and you have the you have the the seeds are there for that kind of thing but it never but it never gets planted and that's why I that's why something that something that I always find amusing is that I have seen plenty of entries within fan fiction that outright tr that outright try and um outright try and amend this problem. Um, especially, especially the funniest instance of this was um, and this is what ended up prompting um Adeptus Evangelion, which I will argue got more out of Ava than any than anyone else did. They they. It start. It started with when someone on TG discovered a fa discovered a bit of fan fiction where Shinji walking along the beach happens to find a um a footlocker that that's been sealed. Within that footlocker is somebody's entire collection of forty k miniatures and the books, <laughs> and this <laughs> somehow inspires him to get his shit together. <laughs> Of course, that'd be something that draws your attention. Oh uh, well, well, yeah. There's definitely that, but <laughs> it's not like it's not like he's trying. It's not like he's going and screaming for the emperor or anything like that. It does it does change quite a quite a bit with how this with how the story progresses. But um, it's one it's one it's one of those things that I always I always found kind of kind of funny. Um, and then TG got a hold of it, and they ended up making a whole RPG based based on using um, Evangelion and the uh, roll under D one hundred system that Dark Heresy uses. And fuck me, it works. I even reviewed it a while back. That's why I wa that's why I wanted um, Mr. Ricar the Mr. Ricari's neighborhood clip, but timing didn't work out. Which, if you, for those of you listening, if you don't know what that is, go watch Metro Night Live. You're welcome. If you want to co contact me, I will link you to it. I have the recording myself. Mm -hmm. But when, but to that end, I think I think one of the other, I think one of the real um, one of one of the one of the real cases of 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 where of where the deconstruction really escaped him is the introduction of Seely. Mmm. Ah, yes, the Lale Lule Lo of Evangelion. Which, 
the the idea of the idea of a shadow organization that's the true bankrollers of of Nerve, the Geofront, and all that. I have no problem with that. And Razafon had something similar with the Bobum Foundation. Incidentally, I consider Razafon to be basically a better version of Ava. Um, although it's gotten more in common with, with Ray Dean than than Ava, but sti but still, in that one you actually had somebody who developed. In more in more ways than one, um, but when it but when it comes but um when it comes to when it comes to Sealy, the pro, the big the big problem is is that 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 is once again a mystery that is that is um nev that is never that is never satisfactorily solved. You ha hell the hell the whole having them be having them appear as um as these as the as these plates instead instead of sh instead of showing them as they as they did early on um only only for only further hampers the point only further hampers that point because with it because. And I'm not saying that we need to know who every member of the twelve people within Sealy are, but I think having some sort of understanding about who they are and and why they do what they do can can work wonders instead of get instead of getting that kind of thing at the end. Yeah, because even and even at the end, we never truly know what their end goal was. What was their what was their plan? What were they trying to do? We never truly know. <laughs> we have there's the there's the implication that what that um they, that their particular goals and the goals of um of get of Gendo were not eye to eye. That get that Gendo was sim that Gendo was simply um you was using that was trying to use them for his for his own goals. Which I, I always perceived as fi find a way to be reunited with his wife, but yeah, the pr but the problem is it was it was it was either too subtle or not subtle enough, and that go and that and when it comes to deconstructing super robots, yes, there there have been the whole organization working behind the scenes of, of the good guys, but um, us usually. There's usually there's at least some some sort of um, gun going off in che in Chekhov's gun. Um. Yeah, it's funny. This kind of reminds me of another anime that I've actually got a review coming out for that had the same exact problem. Because secret organization that we never really know what their actual goal is and just kind of get written off. There's an anime called Ingress the Animation based on the mobile game. They did the exact same thing. Secret group behind the scenes that were, that were funding the bad guys. But before we can find out what their goal was, they get killed off. Like, literally. Um... Yeah, and I know I know somebody might somebody might point out um, Axis when it comes to my own work, but um, Axis. But even even though even though I have been very critical of what I did for Ryder, I think I was I think I was fairly clear about what Axis's goals were. Yeah, I don't think we had that same problem with Axis because yeah, we 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 knew they were up to a, spe a specific thing. What they were, go how they wanted to accomplish that goal may have been a mystery, but we knew that they had a goal. Mm -hmm. We knew what their motivation was. But yeah. with Sele, we didn't even know what they were planning or what they wanted. And if you try to throw an end, the end of Evangelion, it gets even more confusing. <laughs> like the closest that we can go is the human enhancement project as it was known originally and then later on referred to as human as human instrumentality um which is something that I chalk up to the fact that 
Trans translation translations in the late '90s and early 2000s was um was still a mixed bag. <laughs> Understatement. <laughs> um, and as somebody who's a fan of Orphan, I can I can attest to this kind of thing because it went from Crisinello to Crelancelo is his true name. Yeah, it, it's let's put it this way, folks. You know it's sad. When a frickin' hentai of Evangelion does a better job of explaining the human instrumentality project than the actual series did. And yes, that's actually a thing. I'll have to I um I'll have to I'll I'll have to judge I'll have to judge on that judge on that after the fact, so I'm gonna I'm gonna need those details later for science. Oh, I can make it really simple. It was literally it was them trying to repopulate the world through a lot of uh, well, you know. <laughs> That oh. was literally the entire. That was the literally entire uh, movie, but it it still gave you an explanation as to what the instrumentality project was. It was something. <laughs> That's how sad it is that this movie that literally just used the instrumentality project as an excuse for fucking did a better job of explaining that than Evangelion itself actually did. Now, when it comes to, to when it comes. The other, the other thing, t the other thing to t to con to consider is um. Like cons consider what it, consider the um full names for the three Ava units that that were in act that were in active use. Unit zero is the prototype. Fair point. It's the it was the it was the original model where they were, where they were trying to make sure that the thing could actually move around. Unit one. Is the or the o or the oni is referred to as the test type, although what it's actually testing is never is never fully gone is never fully gone into. And unit two is the production model, which is funny because when we finally saw mass production Avas, they look completely different. <laughs> Not even close. Um, but the point is. The only the only one that ever really got a proper explanation for its given name was Unit Two. It's the production model, i.e., this is the model that was going to be used for mass-produced versions of Ava. And the and um, but when it comes to the other ones, I could. I could make I could connect the dots and guess that the whole the whole berserker system is what the is what was being tested which has prompted some theories that that um Yui's spirit is in that is in that particular um model but other, other than the concept of the prototype and the production model the um the names te the names tend to have less explanation and speaking of names Let's talk about what the heck AT is supposed to be in AT field. Ugh. Like, I don't, I don't think it wasn't, I don't think it wasn't until Ka until Kaoru came up that we actually got an explanation for what the hell an AT field is. Effectively, effectively, the it's supposed to be the boundary between in between indivi individual identities. Um. Which, which given the given the fact that earlier on there was the talk of the hedgehogs dilemma of hedgehogs wanting to be close to each other but um, not wanting to hurt each other because of their spines, that's that cer that certainly fits within it. But um, this is one of those cases where TG got more out of it by by referring to it as absolute territory. I e I e go going full going full going full in on the on the whole idea of it being this bi this um barrier between barrier between in between individual selves, which is which granted that's it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a stretch but at least it makes sense instead instead of just saying that ev that angels angels and Avas have this energy shield that. That um they ha that they have for s that we know about for some reason but never but never fully go into. Um, I get the feeling that Hideaki Anno 
would have wor would have worked better if he was doing a straight if he was doing a straight tokusatsu work where he didn't have to explain a lot of stuff but he tried to lean into hard science yeah and not helped by the fact that the actual name of the at field and i'm actually verifying this through an evangelion wiki absolute terror field mm -hmm. and like looking at this yeah it's basically just supposed to be a field that holds basically human body uh, holds living bodies together, holding their egos and separating themselves from other individuals, which if you really want to stretch, it does explain a lot about the end of Evangelion. But again, we're not going to get too deep into that, mm -hmm. but Oh boy, you have to, that, that's Mr. Fantastic getting drawn quarter levels of stretching. This is why I say that TG got got better use out of it by calling ab by calling it absolute territory. Because in um Ad Ava as it was called, there's a whole system of abilities that rely on that field. It's not just for defense. But ultim ultimately Even, even, even with the, even with the, de even with the attempt to deconstruct, um, I don't, I don't really, despite how much of an, inf despite how much of an influence Evangelion was, I don't think the, I don't think the deconstruction approaches that it, that it was trying to do really stuck in the history of anime. No, not really. Like, what also doesn't help is that when you uh, when you think about it, Ano also tried to inject a lot of his own personal beliefs, I would say, into the series. The biggest one being postmodern existentialism, which I have I have no problem with with tackling um, existentialism with it within a, within a given work, but the problem is you can't be spinning plates. Yeah, and the thing is that a lot of the um, a lot of the fanfics that attempt to uh, that attempt to address this issue, they tend to downplay that existentialism part. Because that it, it's one of the biggest problems with the ending, especially, is how that whole scene of Shinji realizing you know he needs to be one with himself. It just rings so hollow after the entire series, and again, it comes back to the whole completely, out, completely out of nowhere. One eighty, he pulls like all of a sudden he just now realizes, I have to be happy with myself. Well, yeah, duh, you should have been like that 10, 10, 15 episodes ago. Where were you? Mm -hmm. Now, that's that's the reason. That's also the reason why I say that ha having a character that you can understand but not relate to. The pro the problem with that is that you can do that kind of character, but I hesitate to say you can do that with a protagonist. Yeah. The, like, if we, when it comes, you can typically do that with a secondary character, or with or with a antagonist, or even an anti villain. You can do that kind of thing. Um, but with but with a protagonist, a bit less so. Like if you have somebody who you. Now, when I refer to an anti-villain, I'm specifically referring to people whose whose actions are wrong, but at the same time, you can understand why they did what they did. Um, I had a bit of a debate on this when it came to the Harry Potter fandom when the movies wrapped up over what um, Dumbledore did near the end of that, where some people said it was wrong to have that kind of gambit. And objectively speaking, yeah, it was. However... It was it was a means to give to give them an edge against well the, against he who shall not be named. So so it's as Chuck would say it's evil but it's the right kind of evil, and yeah I'm also going to include in the pale moonlight as another example of that because there was no right in what Cisco did. He com he committed se he committed several crimes that in any other situation probably would have gotten him court martialed. But because of the fact that it ended up being a turning point for the for the war, 
I don't think he ever. Uh, I don't think if anyone ever did find out about what he did, they would have they would have court martialed him for it. Probably would have gotten the hell of a, a talking down from his superiors, but that's probably about it. Yeah. And it's and to, and to be honest, it wouldn't be necessary because because the because um the because he was already he was already ju he was already judging himself more harshly than any court martial would have. Exactly. Um. But the th but the thing is when it comes but that would but even with that that was just one fa that was just one facet. When it comes when it comes to somebody like say Jamie Lannister, um, he's cer he is certainly no he is certainly no saint in any regard, and he has a lot of shit happen to him. But he but in his ca but in his case, if it's un it's a it's a very understandable kind of situation. Um, in the case of Shinji, the the approach that he ha the approach that he has with everything and. This is one moment where I will I will address the rebuild movies and the fact that it seems that it leans towards him being more mentally broken, which is a um a bit is a bit of a step in the rightish direction. But at the same time, ultimately, you're going to need a character that you're that you that the audience can get behind in some form or another. If you don't have if you don't have that, you're not going to have a very strong story, especially if you're stretching it out over twenty six episodes. Like an unlikable protagonist that can work great in a short film, and it has. But this isn't a short film. It's a very very long film. And when it now when it comes to um, when it comes to the when it comes to the other mysteries again it's a case of not of um, having a payoff but that payoff doesn't make the journey worth it. But I th but I think that I th I think ultimately the big the big problem and the reason why um, Evangelion fails as a deconstruction is. Not being able to commit, and I know I, I'm, I've made the Doctor Cox joke a bunch of times. I'm not going to do it again, but that is ultimately the ma the major failing: the fact that it is not able to go all the way in deconstructing just the super robot genre, or just Ultraman, whichever your interpretation is. It doesn't. It doesn't want to. It doesn't want to go all the way with that. If you want to do the existentialism thing, fine. If you want to do the um su the what super robots would really be like thing, fine. Both of them have both of them have been done. Now that's how that's how real robots started was basically that. Yeah, that's what Gundam pretty much was. It was a response to the ridiculousness of super robots and wanted to see what it would look like in a realistic setting. Mm -hmm. And well, I think the results speak for themselves on that regard. But this was a case of Anno wanting to have his cake and eat it too. Yeah, and I think what's really telling is how uh, is how other people have taken his concepts and and ran with it in their own ways. One of the one of the big ones that com that comes to mind for me is the Angelic Days manga, which was kind of this alternate universe take on the whole thing, where it wherein um. Wherein you, wherein you were, where uh, Shin, where Shinji was a bit more of a normal um, s student. I remember that there was one other one that um, that took a more action focus and had with and had uh, and had um, Asuka's main weapon being the uh, being that giant hat hatchet whatever thing that the um, mass produced Avas have. Mm. Um. It was it was kind of go it was kind of going into into a bit into a bit of a I don't want to say full I don't I don't want to say full shonen but kind of halfway between shonen and shojo with that particular style and that wasn't mm -hmm. written by Anna it was written by somebody else um and Angel Angelic Days was was essentially 
Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Um, all, that that it's a wonderful lifestyle scene that happened in the finale where you ha- where you have the notion of um sh- of Shinji being um ch- being childhood friends with Asuka and <laughs> get and Gen and Gendo Gendo still living with his still living with his wife with them being effectively an old married couple. <laughs> oh, yes, dear. She who must be obeyed. <laughs> um, like that, and Ray, and Ray being completely di- completely different to the point where when I saw that for the first time, I did a spit take. <laughs> and. The, and that that was taken into that was taken into making its into making its own into its own manga all, all on its own. And I'm not going to say it's great, but it is interesting. And that's something I find funny with this sort of thing. The failing of it res- resulted in people wanting to try and I don't want to say fix, but adjust, but um, adjust it. I get. I guess I can say. In a in a way that that addre- that addresses the problem and tries to make it into something a little more coherent. No one one man one man's trash ends up being made into another man's treasure. Yeah, pretty much. Now, to that end, to that end, I think it. I think this is a point. This is a good point to shift into Madoka Magica, and how that succeeds as a deconstruction. Well, first, first off, while well, having better visuals, even if I did make a few wideness jokes, along with, <laughs> along with other, along with other, along with other jokes. But then again, you're dealing with a guy who likes who likes sharing who likes sharing Nina memes solely to torment Full Metal Alchemist fans. <laughs> yes, folks, he's done this many times. But let's. First of all, we got to take a look at the magical genre. As well. Unlike Evangelion, which it's hard to pin down exactly what it's deconstructing, with Ma- with Madoka, it's very painfully obvious. Mm-hmm. It is going after the magical girls genre, which during that time was very much set in its ways. You knew if you were turning on a magical girl anime, you knew exactly what you were getting. You were getting cute girls having getting superpowers from some cute little mascot and battling monsters of some kind. And it was, you know, and, and there was very formulaic. I mean, you know, Sailor Moon may have been the the, the 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 one that everyone knows, but by this point, you had stuff like the Pretty Cure series pretty much locking in what a magical girl anime was. Mm-hmm. So it was very easy to deconstruct that kind of genre with a series like Madoka. I mean, I mean, right away you have the main protagonist suddenly getting thrust into this world of magical girls. You had the cute mascot giving them superpowers. Oh, we'll get to him. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you had them battling bad guy, battling evil monsters. Mm-hmm. But right away you see that things aren't one of the biggest things here is a case of things are never what they appear to be pretty much i would i would say for the first two episodes a lot of people might might look at it as being in that sta- in that standard fare i know i know that a lot of my own colleagues thought thought that it thought that at first Sim- simply simply be simply because they didn't they didn't know the fact that now, i want to make something clear not only was gen Urobuchi involved with this but i believe to a certain extent, Akiyuki Shinbo was, and given their given their previous body of work that I was familiar with, by epi- but from day one, I knew that there I knew that um there that the other shoe was going to drop in some form or fashion. I was just waiting to see what, especially when you consider. Let's let's take a moment to to bring up something when it comes to the visuals. And insofar as the fact that there is a very clear line between the more normal st- styles of styles of artwork and the labyrinths. Oh yeah, 
that was their first subtle clue that things were not what they appeared to be. That and maybe the ending theme, but we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like everything up until you get to the first labyrinth seems like your typical magical granite. The visuals are very nice and pretty, very artistic, very bright and colorful, very vibrant. But it looks like your standard anime. And then the labyrinth hits. And you've got this very... And this is where Akiyuki Shinbo's style comes into play. Because he has a very unique art style with that. Most present in his work on the Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei series. Mm -hmm. Where he has these very... How would I even... Like, what would be... I forget the name of the style he uses for these. I've I've always referred to it as um, cutout or, colla yeah. or collage, because that's basically what I felt like I, w I was looking at with a lot of the labyrinths, a living scrapbook, which is accurate in more ways than one, and that's certainly been that's certainly been a factor in in some of the crazier parts with Zetsubo Sensei, which um, you know. Maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think any company has tried to dub Zetsubo Sensei, and God help anyone who who tries. Nope, it has been, I, I believe, I'm actually, I, you know, it's funny you say that, I'm actually checking right now. I don't even think it's ever, well, no, the original series was licensed way back in the day by uh, Nozomi Entertainment, mm -hmm. aka Right Stuff, but noth, noth, they've never licensed the other shows, and none of them were ever dubbed. Which doesn't surprise Wait. me one bit because that would be a challenge to do <laughs> any sort of dub work simply because there's way too many there's way too many jokes and references within that series, even just in the first season, that don't work in English. Yeah. And what also helps this uh the genre piece is the fact that Aki Kishinbo, for him, this was not his first magical girl series. He had actually worked on the original Magical Girl Lyrical Nanoha way back in mm -hmm. 2004. Which so he already had some work in this. Which itself, was, which itself was kind of pushing the lines about what you could get away with and still be considered a Magical Girl series, even if Strikers <laughs> was a letdown. Um, yeah. Well, I think he only worked on the original. I don't see his name attached to the other series. But, he, but even with that, um, Nanoha... Nanoha um, it's no surprise that I ended up seeing music videos set to j set to jam project music from from scenes from that particular series because that's what it was borderline like. <laughs> yeah, it was. But th the point I'm getting at with this is that yeah, he he had between those two series, he had some ideas of what he was going to do with it. And when you get to the labyrinth and see that pop up just uh, collage style art. And it just it creates this very unnatural feeling, especially with how janky, intentionally janky, I should stress, and, and erratic the movement was in those labyrinths. Like everything just felt wrong. It painted a perfect picture of what they were supposed to be. Yeah, and it um in a way in a way it kind of reminded me of um pu of puppet theater that I that I see coming from um, Czechoslovakia. Oh yeah. I've I've seen some comparison to that. I've seen some comparison to to a cer to certain stop motion art that came that came out of France in the um, I don't want to say in the Gothic era, but around that time. And obviously, when I'm talking about this, for anybody who's going to make the bad joke, I'm not talking about that kind of Gothic. Learn okay. your history, folks. Mm -hmm. This is what this is why I always say: read something else, you goddamn bums. Exactly. No, I know exactly what you meant there, thankfully. But yeah, it, but that immediately let you knew that there was something about this world that wasn't right. But it still didn't clue you in as to where the series was actually going unless you knew Urbuchi's and Shinbo's works mm -hmm. until episode three drops. Now, there's a bit of a story behind but when it comes to episode three, and um, I want I want to stress... Take this with a grain of salt, but this is a story that I've heard that I've um, heard I've heard repeated off and on over the years. Some years, some years before this project was um, this project was coming along, 
there was a chair there was going to be a charity event at a hospital i believe in tokyo and several ma several manga art several manga ka were go were going to be involved in it one person who was who was supposed to be in it but ended up backing out was akira toriyama ostensibly over some sort of payment issue which strikes me as odd because why would you be arguing about payment for a charity show but gen urobuchi was there and and one and one of the people who was in, who was um who was in who was in that hospital was a cancer patient and some and apparently that very the experience of that very much affected him, and it's speculated that was what um, inspired Charlotte in episode three. Because mm. it's already heavily implied that whoever Charlotte was, they were some they were um, some sort of cancer patient who prob who probably wasn't able to have sweets because of the effect of chemo. Would go to explain them what happens in rebellion. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but, give, but up until that, up until we, up until we see Charlotte and see, and see what looks like a pretty unassuming t type of, type of design that you, that you'd be surprised would even be a witch. And then the shoe drops. <laughs> Everything is all nice and hunky-dory, you Mommy comes in, takes out her big guns, and blows her away. And I don't mean those kind of big guns you purrs, knock it off. And then Charlotte reveals her true form, and well, uh, yeah, uh, mommy, don't go losing your head over it, over it or anything. Yeah, that spawned a bunch of memes. Some of some of which I've gotten yelled at for using, especially the one with the fridge. <laughs> I love that one. I love. It. Oh shit. Um, the one that really got me in trouble was 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 syncing that up to "Don't Lose Your Head" by Queen. <laughs> and what really boggles me is that's not the first time I did that. I did that with Highlander years ago. Yeah, it, it's just because uh, cute girls. You know how it is. You know how you, you know how like anime like otaku can be sometimes. Fucking I, weeaboos. I and that's I, coming from me. <laughs> I know. I I just I just like give I just like giving I just like giving weeaboos a lot a lot of shit. <laughs> Because, <laughs> well, if you're gonna give me an open target, then don't be don't be surprised when I keep shooting. <laughs> How apropos. <laughs> yeah. Um, another little another little random fact that I I noticed that whole that whole that whole two gun fighting th thing that we see mommy doing dur during that episode. I ended up tilting an eyebrow about it and thinking, is that fucking equilibrium? Then I did a little <laughs> bit of digging. And I found gets. out that one of the people involved had actually written a very short one-shot um, equilibrium fan fan novel called Emblem of the Sacred Flame. <laughs> and I ended up going through. I ended up going through the thing, and yeah, everything everything made sense after that. But it was going <laughs> full on gun kata, and yeah. Uh, and while it's impressive that they were able to do that animated, and I'd like to see more, um, I'd like to see that style used more often in, in anime. I'm pretty, sh I'm pretty sure I'd pay money to see somebody animate Death the Kid doing that. <laughs> but that was just one of those interesting little de little details that I ended up coming across as a result. Now, when it, now of course when it comes to after that. Then, then things start getting dicey with with Kyo, with with um Kyoko getting in, getting into the getting into the picture, who is um not nice. And I will ag I will agree with the with the um with something that Chuck Sonnenberg brought up when he did his overview of the series. Because aside from when she's fighting, we we almost always see her eating. And there is well, a, yeah, there is a reason mm -hmm. for that because it was her wish. Yeah, she just you know she was that that was one of the things that I think should have clued us in that even early on that this was something different. 
And this was a case, like the biggest secret of Madoka Magica's story is it's a case of monkey's paw when it comes to the wishes because every magical girl gained their powers through a wish. They all made a wish getting their heart, getting the thing they wanted most. And that was the price they paid was to become a magical girl and fight witches. Mm -hmm. But we would quickly learn that for in pretty much all cases, it was a monkey's paw. There was, oh, the, you know, the wishes were never quite exactly what they wanted. Or, or the, or, um, in, or in some, or in other cases, the wishes led to some sort of unintended consequence. Yeah. And, and, and in her case, it was, to, it was to, it was food for her family, but, and, but, um, af but after the fact, things got really dicey for said family and they, and, and, um, she ended up being the only one left. And it's the, I don't think, I think it was somewhat stated in some of the supplemental material that Mommy's wish was to not die alone. Which, I guess what? that wish was, I guess that wish was granted. <laughs> but, e but even with even with all even with all those wishes it does re it does result in in um certain protagonists having a having a much higher a, mu a much higher death count than other protagonists might have especially kyoko but yeah and and th this all falls back onto what i mentioned earlier about the cute little mascot character giving them superpowers because <laughs> Let's get let's get into that and why and why all and why all bunnies and all bunny cats shall be shot on sight. Survivors will be <laughs> shot again. Yes. And uh, and those of you who saw my playthrough of Shadow Warrior know that's not that's not me making an empty boast because anytime I saw a rabbit in that game, I shot it, <laughs> including the demon one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes, let's talk about QB. Now, I gotta admit right off the bat, like. Again, this was another case of if you were paying attention, you could see something was up because Homura immediately wanted the bunny dead, and you're like, "Why would you want to kill the it? What like? Why would you want the cute little innocent bunny cat dead? What's going on here? Like, why? What is your hatred coming from? There must be something else going on." And then you learn what it's really about, and it all begins to make sense. And then you want to see the bunny cat dead. <laughs> And the thing is, eventually we did see the bunny cat dead, and then it and then it got better and just, and um, decided to do the most unique version of waste not want not. Exactly, but yeah, like the whole idea of oh, it's an alien species that thrives on the energy from entropy. It likes to see things come apart. I that's not that wasn't the vibe that I ended up getting. It was that they were they were a species that was trying to slow down entropy, so uh, stave off the heat death of the universe. Ah, that's fair. Uh, they, but they they used the despair caused from a from a magical girl turning into a witch to mm -hmm. kind of prevent that. So you could argue they had good intentions. It's just their methods are beyond questionable. Now, when it comes to the que when it comes to the question about whether Q whether um, Q Bay and hi and his species are evil, um, I wouldn't go so far as to s to say to say that they're evil. More more that they are completely amoral. They um, kind of remind me a bit of the anti spirals from Girl in the Gun in that res in that sense, because yeah, the anti spirals they were aggressive, but. When you think about how their backstory was, it made perfect sense why they ended up the way they did. Their whole world was destroyed by spiral power, so they decided to completely abandon it and became anti-spirals. So, yeah, and they were wanting to make sure that spiral power wouldn't come back and destroy the universe. So, good meth, good uh, good reasoning, bad methods. Mm -hmm. Um, I would I would say that compare contrasting. 
the interesting thing with contrasting those two is the fact that the anti-spirals were were far too emotionally attached. Cube is not. No. Like when it when it comes to Q, when it comes to Cube, um, it may as well just it may as well just be items on a spreadsheet. Yeah, because you notice it never even when it loses, it never gets angry. It never gets aggressive. It never gets, you know, it never gets emotional about anything. It's just, well, I guess that's that taken care. Of. I guess that's that, that's gone. We'll just move on to the next. I think to that end, I do think Cube understands emotions on, only as only, but understands them as a mean as a means to a certain end. I.e., a means. A, a good example. A good example of this is him. Impl- is him implying. That the re the reason what the reason why Monica would be would eventually would potentially become so powerful of of a witch is be is because of Homer's actions going through t- going through time. Like he has no he has no reason to outright say something like that except to play except to instill doubt. It it knows enough to know how to manipulate them. Yeah. You could you could argue sociopathy, but um, there are other there are other things regarding his character that don't fit that mold. Like somebody like Dio is a sociopath. Um, some somebody somebody some somebody likes um, um, Kira Yoshikage, and um, I apologize for making two JoJo references, but these two are, uh, they came to mind when I was thinking of sociopathic characters in anime. They they count as they count as as very much being within the boundaries of sociopathic tendencies. Um, I know somebody might I know somebody might argue might argue might argue Kaisa from Fies. I don't think he was a sociopath. He was just crazy. He <laughs> he was psychotic. He wasn't a sociopath. There is he there is a uh, d- there is a very very clear difference and. I will freely admit that I'm a poor layman when it com- when it comes to psychology, but I think I know enough to know that there, to know that there's a difference between the two. He um actually actually I think Ken and Cube uh, you know Kusaka and Kube were actually a lot more alike than you might think. And here let me explain why. When it comes to the two JoJo villains we mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. Dio and Kira, they we, the reason why we can classify them as sociopathic is everything they did, every move they made, was strictly in service of the, of their own personal gain. They were in it one hundred percent for themselves. They, you know, but when you look at Kusaka, he saw the Orthodox as a threat. He saw them as a danger to humanity. And he had, and because of that, and because of what happened with uh, Mari, he had a seething hatred of them. It wasn't personal gain, but it was a gain that would have benefited him. But in the same way that goes kind of with QB, what he does isn't specifically for his personal gain, but for the gain of what he seeks, of the end goal of preventing the heat death of the universe. So. Really, I think I can sum this up, especially this especially applies to QB with one button. Because all of QB's actions simply served the greater good. The greater good. Shut it. <laughs> and the thing now now um I should note that I was I was also get I was also going to bring up Hojo as a as a bit as a bit of a smart ass thing, but um Hojo's not a psychopath or a sociopath. He's just a pussy. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and now, of co- now, of course, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to um a, when it comes to a certain well, mermaid, who who act, who did take the plunge and, and make a wish. I'd say I'd say that was where we started to see the unra- the unraveling and the and and how and how being 
and how having that particular power and that particular responsibility is is walking a very precarious mental tightrope. Ah, Sayaka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her initially, everything about her was good intentions, just like the others. She wanted to save the person she cared about, someone who was pretty much unable to play violin again and wanted to see him play. And this is, once again, where the monkey's paw comes in. She technically did get her wish. She just didn't get the wish she herself wanted. He did learn to play the violin again. He learned, He was able to play the violin again. He was able to leave the hospital. But she never... You, when it comes to wishes like this, you have to be very explicit on what you want. Because if you don't tell... if You, you pretty much have to have a like 60-page essay on what you want. You'd probably have to have it read over by your lawyer. you probably have to have it double-checked by your lawyer. Yes. Because if you leave even a slight loophole, it will fuck you over. Which is what we see with Sayaka. So she, when she first gets the wish, everything is all hunky-dory. He's able to play again. She's happy. And thus, she's more than happy to jump into the magical girl thing because, well, she's got the motivation that she's gotten her wish. But then, much like Mommy, the other shoe drops. Turns out, he only cared for her because she was the only one who was willing to come to him. And now that she he's got an audience again, fuck, I don't need you. The other something else that I think that I think um, that that was po that was pointed out by um, Chuck is a lot a lot of a lot of the inspiration from 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 uh, Madoka Magica comes from Goethe's Faust. Arguably one, of, arguably one of the most famous German plays of all time. Oh yeah. Um, and yeah, a lot of people know about know about Faust because of the whole de because of the whole deal with the devil. Um, but whenever but whenever people discuss Faust, they never really discuss the t the um, terms that Faust had with his deal. He had he because. Well, first off, the whole thing with the whole thing with Faust was another one of those God and God and Satan playing playing a game, kind of like kind of like the Book of Job, although mm. uh, although significantly less cruel because I really don't like the Book of Job. <laughs> um, but he but what he had specifically said to the to the devil is. If I am ever in a position of complete contentment, where I, where I um where I'm in a, I where I do not want to I want to be in that particular position where I am forever, then you can have my soul. And that and that's the reason why the, why um the devil goes so far to try and flatter him to put him in that kind of state. And it ulti it ultimately backfires because in doing so he ends up finding a kind of enlightenment because Act Three of Faust was weird, um, <laughs> but in but in but um, I'd I'd say when it comes to when it comes to the contract you have a you have a similar approach it's just that instead of contentment it's despair. Because when when they when they lose all, when they lose all, a lot, in a lot of concepts in um, Buddhism, and I will admit I'm a I'm a poor layman with this, but it's all but a core tenet is around attachments. When you think about a lot of when you think about a lot of the people who had something to wish for, um, it is tied to a certain attachment, and that attachment ends up getting twisted against them. Losing that attachment is what really is what really sets someone on the path to loot to um gaining that much despair and be and gaining that much negativity and eventually becoming a witch. Mm. Um. So it is it is still doing the whole the whole thing with the whole thing with Faust just in a just in a dip just in a different approach. And. That's and that's precisely what happened with her. She 
she um she did get her wish, but there was some there was someone uh, but she unfortunately had some competition when it came to his affections. And that was the thing that really started the started the downward spiral. And then the whole incident with the subway train. <laughs> oh boy. Which um he here being within being within earshot of, of that and think because especially since when she, when she became a when she became a magical girl she she went all in on be on being the hero of the town the hero of justice and, and all of that and seeing seeing the negativity from those people can can put the thought in my mind of what why should i why should i risk my neck for people who don't who can't who can't who can't possibly earn such can't possibly earn such a thing i.e. Why should they be deserving of any of any sort of saving? And putting those two elements together, well, the results are inevitable. Yeah. And of co- of course, in, of course, in the process of that, we also learned that. Um, I think what I think one of the best jokes we got out of Chuck was the, during the whole thing was. Was the accusation that they that they were being turned into zombies, when technically speaking, he's right. They're not zombies. They're liches. <laughs> I mean, it's the same. It's the same reason Davy Jones is a lich. As you you have an un, you have an undying body with their soul with their soul in some sort of object separated from that. If that ain't a lich, I don't know what is. Pretty much. And to the, to that particular extent, that that because of the fact that in doing that they essentially stop being human, which in a way kind of reminds me of that whole thing with um with skull where he where. He felt that he stopped being he would stop being human if he decided to start using the skull memory. Um, but in this in this case, they literally are, and we and we also learn. I think we also learned from some of the supplementary material that once you do take that role, you stop aging too. Yeah. So, a little bit of a twisted take on the whole Peter Pan thing. But when it when it comes to when it comes to it, seeing seeing that seeing that kind of thing is is something that further pushes. And the thing about despair, the thing about madness, is that the Joker was right. It is like gravity. All it takes is a little push, and then it just spirals further and further down. Now. When it comes when it comes to um, when it comes to Monica, that's where that's where there's a kind of weak link within the, within the story because of how well her her dub. I don't want I don't want to give too much slack to her dub actress, but um, the voice was a little off. For Monica herself, yeah. I'm gonna chalk that up to direction because. I know the VA for Monica herself, Christine Marie Cabado. She's a great VA. And it does, it, it, her kind of voice would make sense for that kind of character. I just get the sense that probably something happened with the direction. All right. That, that actually make that actually makes more sense. What, um, it's been, it's been a while, but remind me some of the other stuff that she's, um, that she's been involved in. Right off the bat, Toradora. Would be the one I would think of right off the top of my head because I remember she was in Toradora. Now, the other some now when it comes to Homer or um Home Run John as she as she ended up getting nicknamed a few times on um two on two channel during during the production. Mm-hmm. Um, Chuck was right when he compared that to Sisyphus.
because because well she is somebody who's who who keeps who keeps fighting a losing battle but in, but in, but intends to continue on no matter no matter what mm. um and of, of course definitely helped by the by the fact that she is a ti that she is a time manipulator well i would say time and space because she li quite literally has a bag of holding <laughs> Where she can pull fucking rocket launchers out of her ass. Mm -hmm. And within the within that within that partic within that particular um that particular motif I think that I think that's why her I think that's why it was a smart move to dedicate a whole episode to all the times that she's failed and um I get the distinct impression that even though we saw I think five five um timelines in that regard those were probably not the only times no i think that was just to establish that yeah she's done this a lot and g gave us just enough to understand that yeah every she's gone through so many timelines so many versions of madaka to get to this point that she was nearing her breaking point as it was mm -hmm. And then, when she thinks she's finally got it, a version of Monica that doesn't immediately jump on the deal, she's going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that it stays that way. Yeah. And of course, what, um, what, en what ends up complicating things is Valpurgis knocked. Which, I will admit, I, I, have no I had known about that particular date as, as a... Uh, as a pagan holiday in Germany for ye for years before that. And no, I didn't hear about that name from where you think I did. <laughs> um, again, I always I always try and make sure I keep myself properly prepared. But the uh, first first the whole the whole concept with some with something like well per well Pergus knocked um Essentially, essentially a su a super witch to the point where it doesn't even need a labyrinth. That that's one of those cases where it's an it's very much an exercise in proper build up. Because well, for a lot of people, all that they see is just a massive storm. So that which is leaning a little bit on the convenient end of things. <laughs> yeah, just just a bit. But what also helps in that regard for that buildup is the fact that we see Val, uh, Valpurgis knock in the very first episode in Monica's dream. Or possibly a uh, vision of a past lifetime. Let's, we'll take that as you will. But we immediately know some big's coming. Mm -hmm. And keep, keep in mind that it, at one point Tomura was going to make a deal with Kyoko that... If they, if she would, if she would team up for that specific thing, then she would, then she would leave that, then she would leave the area afterwards. Since there's a, since it's implied that there's a bit of a turf attitude when it comes to magical girls. Yeah, and that's why Kyoko's too stubborn to realize that you know maybe this might not be a bad idea. Um. And when it. And of course, when it come, when we finally see it, for, there is there is the bit of the circusy approach, which is um, par which is par for the course when it comes to the design of witches. But there's also the fr there's also the frankly ridiculous amount of durability that this witch has because <laughs> I think I I think this is one of those cases where we have orc levels amount orc levels of Daka. <laughs> like, rows upon rows of fi of firearms. Um, a, a enough enough rocket launchers to to fight a small war and an entire stadium's worth of claymores. Just to, just to name a few. That's a, I know we say there's no kill like overkill, but um, that might that might be pushing it a little bit. <laughs> but and this is where I get into the the whole thing with them. Um, the whole thing with Cubay, because the reason the reason why um, Homura had the mindset of 
of uh, confront of confronting it by herself if need be is in her in her mind this is her last shot because if she if she has to go through this again no especially considering what Cube had said she's only going to make the problem worse mm. i.e. all i.e. all of that all of that um karmic build up which actually makes sense in a in a manner of speaking. Mm -hmm. um, one could one could argue that making a wish is violating the rules of karma, so karma has to bite back in order to equalize itself. Which is what we see a lot with the other wit with the other wishes. How like their wishes, you know, things change that weren't things happen that weren't supposed to happen, so they got to pay back somehow. Which mm -hmm. is a very it's a very um it's a very boot it's a very buddhist thing to thing to put in although um whether or not it would count as buddhism or hinduism in that regard is debatable considering how much considering how much crossway there is um i would say i would say it's more buddhism because the whole idea of good and bad karma is more of a hindu thing but reg but regardless the if if it, because of that dilemma and because of that and because of that doubt she almost she almost does end up become, becoming a witch herself and it isn't until monica finally makes her decision and stops and and stops being passive like she has for most of the for most of the series that things find that things finally work around um I do think what definitely helps is getting a is getting a pep talk from probably the best worst parent you've seen you've seen in anime. <laughs> <laughs> she's a she's a good mother. The problem is the the problem is the drinking part. Yeah. Oh. Um, although I although um some somebody ended up doing a um a a little bit of a four coma that was a case of who's cutting onions. But when it, but when it came to the, when, but the that whole buildup of karma, which should which should have created a witch that would destroy the that would destroy the planet, ends up ends up creating effectively a Valkyrie. That's base. That's basically what Monica turned turned into when she made her wish. And. In do and in doing so, in doing so, kind of, kind of provided an, kind of provided a um out. And that's that's where things would would have would have wrapped up would have wrapped up perfectly. And then rebellion happened. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh. rebellion will be what we what we refer to what we refer in the business as scub. And what I mean by that is, when you have something that's ve that's very that is um, very contentious and divisive between two camps on the matter, it's based on a web comic that ta that talked about the debate between pro scub and anti scub, but nobody can actually has never actually said what the hell scub is. Ah. Um. Now, a story that I have heard is that. Some is that somebody higher up on the food chain wanted a dark ending to Madoka, and that's not what um, Urobuchi had done. And oh. and his approach was, "You want a dark ending? Here you go." I don't know how much stock I put into that, but it is something to take into account. And I wouldn't even call it dark per se. I mean, yeah. There is some darkness to it when you really when you look at the bigger picture, but there's a lot more when you read between the lines, especially at the end. Yeah, no, the idea of having Homura be effectively become the devil and kind of un and kind of showing the other side of 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 what Monica ended up doing by becoming a concept like that. 
it's it's one of it's I think <sighs> I realize I might be in the minority on this, but on some level I feel I feel like that I feel like that I feel like rebellion leaves a um leaves a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. I think the way to look at rebellion is less about the overall story, even though obviously it does play a significant part into that, and more of a follow-up character piece. You know, this was Homura's wish from the start. She wanted to save Madoka. But because Madoka in the original timeline had saved her. But as she got more obsessive over this concept, more invested in this saving, you could see, even in the main series, that she had kind of become a little possessive. This was her Monica she was going to save. And I think the movie kind of explores where that road would lead. She had got, she had to accomplish her goal, yes. But she still lost Monica in the end because now Monica was basically God. She would never see her again. And that wasn't what she wanted. And it left that little bit of despair. Wasn't much, but it was just enough for something like QB to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And to and within that. I think that I, th I think looking at it as that as that sort of char as that sort of character piece ends up ends up um, ends up being be ends up being better in the long run. Um, at the same at the same t at the same time, it was it was a bit odd because the it that was the third part in a film trilogy, and that film trilogy did make some slight changes to certain of to certain events compared to. The uh, TV series, the least of which being somehow Charlotte ends up becoming this weird mascot thing. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Yeah, in the third movie, that's what happened, but there was a reason for that. Mm -hmm. It was trying to set up a perfect world. That was what QB was trying to do. He set up this paradise for Homer. Up. But then little by little, pick that paradise apart. So having Charlotte not be the one to kill Mommy and instead be her friend to kind of help Mommy's wish kind of makes more sense that way. Flip that script to create the paradise that, that Homer thinks she's got only for QB to slowly break it down. So to con to create that ultimate despair that he was seeking. Now that that I can that I can definitely um I can definitely make sense of. Um. Now when it come now. Getting ba getting back to the whole issue of um deconstruct deconstruction, I th I think the commitment issue is the is the reason why. Uh, Monica ends up working well, ends up working better as a deconstruction, and um, unfortunately, it ends up having the other aspect that can happen with a deconstruction that ends up being a success. AKA the reason why Alan Moore hates what happened to comics after Watchmen. The copycat effect. Yeah, because <laughs> other other series ended up ended up trying to do ended up trying to go about this route, and kind of missed the point in the process. They I think they looked they looked at Monica and saw this is this is a this is a dark work and it was like well if we if we if we make a dark magical girl series we'll be successful too. That's not what that's not what he was trying to do. Yeah, I think the biggest I think the one example that comes to mind for me is Yuki Yuna is a hero which definitely was trying to crib off Monica heavily and while it wasn't outright terrible, it definitely missed the mark. It's it's one of the, it's one of those cases where um, 
You la you launched fine, but you didn't stick the landing. Exactly. Or to put it another way, you tried doing a superhero landing. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um. Now, gr now, granted, now, granted, the problem hadn't been as pervasive as what happened with Watchmen, but it what, but it was a bit, but it was a bit of a problem. And fortunately, I th I think the success of something like Symphonic Gear helped alleviate the issue, even if um, even if I've been soured on that on that anime because of Cure. <laughs> I was about to say, I'm like, wait, wait, you mentioned Sinfo Gear? Wait, wait, you hear that? I think I hear I think I hear Cure Crystal squeeing like a schoolgirl right now. <laughs> If I hear... Not the first time I've made that joke. Yeah, and look, look, you look, you're welcome to the monastery. Everybody gets roasted, and <laughs> it wouldn't be fair of me to do that if I, considering how many times I make the I make the uh, Max joke with misanthropic. So there you go. Get in line, but yeah, no. And, and to be fair, not only are there's just stuff like Simple Gear, but. A lot of the more mainstream ones, like Sail like right, not long after Sailor Moon made its return with Crystal, Pretty Cure was still going on and is still going on to this day. So there were still plenty of other series that were sticking to their group, sticking to their uh, sticking their ground, and not going grim dark. Unlike the comic book industry, which pretty much went all in after, you know, Miller and and uh, Moore did their thing. Mm -hmm. Like they pulled a complete shift in the industry. But with Magical Girls, yeah, there were a few attempts at copycats, but the entire genre didn't make a drastic shift as a result. Yeah. Now, when... The other... But the... The main... The main thing when it, com when it comes to the, the commitment, like we, like we said earlier, with with mo with um with mo with Evangelion they were trying they it was trying to do deconstructing um super robots and do postmodern existentialism with this with Monica there was there was there it was focused on doing one thing deconstructing magical girls and that worked to its benefit that's the reason why I keep making the Dr. Cox Cox um commit joke and I'll stop I'll stop making that joke when it stops make when it stops fitting <laughs> aka never pretty pretty much now I'm not I'm not saying either I'm not saying either sh I'm not saying one is more perfect than the other or something like that but it's more of it's more of having a having a particular goal and pursuing that goal to its extent when when you are tr when you're trying but you can only have really one or two goals at most and really that two is more like a one and a half yeah you you can have a side message but the main message must be the front and center of everything if it isn't it will fall apart and that's where Ava fell apart it was trying to do like three different things at the exact same time and make all three of them the main focal point and it can't hold up. Whereas Monica, it had one goal. Yeah, there were the little tiny side things here and there, but they were they were never they never detracted from the main goal. They were just kind. Of, they were, if anything, they complemented it. Mm -hmm. And the and that and um, with it definitely helped that um, with that within that goal within that goal it didn't um. Even even with the stranger parts of it, it was still it was still falling within that. You were everything was purposeful. When it comes to when it comes when it comes to something when it comes when it came to when it came to the when it came to the aftermath of it, I would I would say I would say if there, if there's anything that came of it, it's. It was a reexamination of of um, whether or not you had to be that set in your ways when it come when it came to doing the whole magical girl approach, and you did start to see a lot more. Even even when um, Crystal came back, it 
or rather, when Sailor Moon came back in the form of Crystal, that was th that was um ta that was taking a few a few notes from from French art because there was because there was that there was that kind of leaning to leaning towards it when it came to um Monica, especially with the design of a lot of a lot of the witches. It's it's very much a French or Czech or Czech kind of kind of artistic approach, and. That's that's the other thing that I think is often not taken into proper account when it comes to deconstructions. If you're going to destroy, then you need to re then you need to rebuild at the end so in, into something different. This is why, say, Scream ended up failing. At least, or at least it was, at least it was, a, at least it was a failure until the reconstruction happened with um, Saw. Now, say what you will about the Saw, about the Saw movies, but it does qualify as kind of reconstructing a new, a new paradigm for horror films. For a bet, for better or for worse, I'm, I, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing on all the Saw films because the first two actually are pretty good. Just the ones after that yeah. that suck. Yeah, but to bring it back to Monica on that, the reason why it worked was because it again at the end, if you know, take e taking rebellion out of the picture, it left with a message of hope, which is something that the Magical Girl series has always thrived upon. So it was saying not everything about the Magical Girl genre needed to be ripped apart. But it needed to be looked at with a finer, with a finer, with a finer lens. But its general message, the general idea, still had merit. So we just need to look at it in a different way, and that was what made it work, and allowed other Magical Girl series to kind of go in a different direction from there on out. Mm -hmm. You know, even Pretty Cure, and again Sailor Moon started changing things up in subtle ways. Yeah. Pretty curtain, maybe not as much, but it was still there were still some subtle changes. But yeah. Other Magical Girl series started getting a little more I wouldn't say realistic, but a little more mature. A little more, you know uh, honest with itself. And we started seeing a lot of different anime in that genre change shit change its shape. And that ended up working out for the best because a lot of great series came out of that. Whereas Evangelion, because it had failed so hard, it didn't even deconstruct properly, much less reconstruct. It, while, yes, it is memorable, it didn't do anything to the genre. The genre had already been deconstructed, as we mentioned earlier. Gundam did more of a deconstruction and reconstruction than Ava ever did. And this was like, what, 10, 20, or 20 years earlier by that point? Yeah. Was... <laughs> and I, and, um, that was, now, um, when it comes to that, I'm, when it comes to that, I'm going to put, I'm going to put one little asterisk as a little, ex as a little, um, experiment. When the when the rebuild series finishes, I will I will be taking a second look at that to see whether or not that does a better job at its deconstruction attempts. Although, given what I've seen from the last three movies, don't don't get your hopes up too much. The only reason the only reason I'm say, um, giving um, saying grain of salt right now is simply because I don't like judging something before it's finished. Yeah. I mean, it is it is clearly trying to do some things a little bit differently, and it's trying to be a little more in-depth, but it really will come down to the finale to decide whether or not it really sticks that landing and finally does it right, or if it's just literally a recreation of the original flaws and all. Mm -hmm. And in that, in, that same, in that same vein... Something that something that I do something that I do find amusing is that in both in both cases the independent tabletop scene um, got got some got some got some material out of it uh, and there was actually there was actually a good amount of stuff 
in that scene that came out of Monica, the the um the big the big instance of this is um magical burst, which was doing a bit of a does a bit of a uh, darker a bit of a darker spin on the whole on the whole concept in that and and um the creator of that you and Culey outright admitted that Monica was an inspiration for that. Like I, as I've said, as I've said so many times, if you want, if you want to really see where tabletop is at, look at the indies. You'll definitely get more out of that than just stick than just sticking with the old twenty di- twenty sided Bible all the damn time. <laughs> but when it com- when it comes to that, the if there's any if there's any coda when it comes to how when it comes to what you, how to do a proper deconstruction is I'd say it's twofold. One, you need to have a very good understanding of what you're aiming at. And two, once you've figured out what you're aiming at, no distractions, no wasted movement. Anything if you if you stray if you stray from the path in any way, your deconstruction will fail. And we've seen plenty of instances of fit of failures of deconstruction. Mm-hmm. Um I think there's been I think there's been a few cases where that's I, if I if I want to use if my ult, and I will admit my ultimate punching bag as to a failure of a deconstruction currently is the Power Slash Rangers short film, which um, I know Nurgle defended it, but um, sorry, buddy, you're still wrong. <laughs> Look, as the as somebody who runs a Power Rangers podcast, I think I can speak on this with at least some monicum, monicum of authority on its own. On its without any connections to the franchise, it's an okay f- little short film. It's it's got it's it's funny. It, it's it's grim. It, it's intentionally grim, dark satire, whatever. But in trying to prove the deconstruction, and actually, even it's cre- even Adi Shankar said it wasn't. A, it never called it a deconstruction. He called it a satire, and but even by that standard, it failed because aside from maybe. One season of Power Rangers, it doesn't match what Power Rangers has ever been. Like even Linkara, who is probably more of an ex, who is probably understood the subject better than I would, said that only one season ever gave ever matched the child soldier aspect of what Power Slash Rangers was trying to do, and that was Samurai. And that season sucked. <laughs> because that because that one you ha- you basically you basically you basically had the equivalent of this is why purists should not write scripts. Uh, fuck you, Zacker. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. I could have I could have swore I saw I could have swore at a convention I saw I saw a um, t shirt that said wanted for crimes against Tokusa- Tokusatsu um, with Zacker's face on it. Kind of kind of a mock up of that whole. Wanted poster um, T-shirt that Mick Foley used to have for uh, Cactus Jack. I don't doubt it for a minute, cause yeah, that was that was so badly handled. It was unbearable, and that wasn't even the worst thing Zacker did during that tenure. But we oh, won't uh, get into that. That's a whole other topic. You know, one of these days, I'm, one of these days, I'll pro- I'll probably I'll probably steal a page out, out of from from um, Plumpy. <laughs> <laughs> and and go and go over go over certain cer- certain um to- certain tokusatsu series and how I um how I try and adapt it. I ended up, it was never recorded, but I ended up having a discussion in that f- in that forum with a few with a few other people um regarding ha- regarding how I'd adapt something like something like samurai. And um, one the one thing that I, the one thing that I made clear is if I had my way, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, that was that. The Sentai was basically saying, "Go ahead, try adapt this." And Zacher was like, "Challenge accepted," and failed. I'm not saying it's impossible to do. What I am saying is that you're going to have a hill to climb. <laughs> so hope you bought a grappling hook because you're going to need it. 
Maybe take maybe take some advice from Brian from Brian Blessed. He's he's done some mountain climbing. <laughs> Although um, if you do that, make sure make sure he's not camping above you because you don't want an instance of somebody shitting in your tea. Yeah, he that's one of his stories. Because I cannot ima- I cannot imagine vertical camping like some, like some mountain climbers do. People are crazy. Let's just be honest with ourselves. Well, have you ever seen Brian Blessed in any interview? I think I, th- I um, I get I get the feeling he'd out crazy all of us. Um, let me let me let me make it simpler. Have you ever seen Brian Blessed? Period. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair question. Because if you've seen him in any role he's done, I think how cr- his cr- level of craziness has been well established. Even even when he's not doing it, even when he's not doing roles, when he's when he's just on like a talk show or something, it's still him. Like <laughs> I don't think it's a case where he's ever playing a character; he's just playing himself. Yeah, they, 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 peop- you don't write roles and then Brian Blessed takes them. You write roles for Brian Blessed to take. Yeah. Um, which in that which in that regard, I have to appreciate that de- that dedication to be, to um, to basically playing oneself like that. It's the same reason why I have a weird respect for Tommy Wiseau, even though I wouldn't let him anywhere near a script. <laughs> because I've I've met him, and the way he is, and the way you see him in, say, the room, no difference. I'm not surprised <laughs> at all. Um, but with it, but. With that, with that in mind, those those are things to delve into in in the future. Um, when it comes, I have seen some people say that um, that the shonen action genre is something that needs deconstruction. I would honestly say no. I'm not I'm not opposed to the idea of a deconstruction, but I think a lot of people are approaching that from a bad faith perspective. I.e. the I.e. the kind of person who roll who rolls their eyes and talks about how much sh- how much sh- how much this or that shonen show is is overrated and it's all the same shit and that that kind of spiel, which ultimately rings hollow for me because like because with enough hyperbole I can say that about any sort of medium. Yeah, the the idea behind a deconstruction is that a genre of media has become so locked in its ways so consistently the same that you need to put a lens to it and say, this is what needs to be changed. You can't, this isn't going to work every single time. Mm-hmm. And That's why Ava and Madoka, even though Ava didn't do it quite right, they were more necessary as deconstructions. Super Robot anime and Magical Girl anime were always doing the same damn thing. Especially magical girl anime. You pull up any magical girl anime prior to Monica, and you pretty much knew what you were watching going in. Yeah. Now, some might ar- I've seen some people argue that do- that doesn't isn't that something of something that um Shonen has a problem with. I would honestly say not to that extent. There, ha- there, because um, even with the popularity of DBZ. The 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 current crop of shonen works are not taking their cues from DBZ. Like, so I know I know we've riffed on Black Clover, but obviously it's doing obviously it's doing something that's not that's not in that vein. Fairy Tale is not doing something in that vein. Um, Hunter Hunter, even though it pre even though it w- I'm not going to say it predates, but it's been around for a, for a similar amount of time, isn't doing the isn't doing the same thing. Well, whenever whenever we get updates, because it's bers- <laughs> because um it's running on Berserk time. Yeah. Plus, that's not count that you're that's only looking at long running shonen mm-hmm. anime. If you were to go into full shonen anime with the shorter series, then you're opening up a whole wide range of different things, and that completely kills the argument right there. Yeah. The when it comes, to, that's the reason why the whole. Oh, all shonen is the same kind of thing. Will always ring hollow for me, 
because that's an argument that only really works if you're looking at the long-running series that have been in Jump Magazine for extensive lengths of time and using that as, as your um, prefix. And this is the reason why I invoked Sturgeon's Law, because the whole point of Sturgeon's Law that people seem to forget with the whole 99% of everything is crap is that you can't look at a few examples of a given medium and make a broad judgment on that entire medium. Because that's what people were doing with science fiction. They were taking some of the some of the worst pulp examples and proclaiming that all SF um, literature sucked. And while well, you can certainly do that, it's it's not it's um it's not it's one of those things where where once you try and advance that argument you're going to get torn a new asshole. Yeah, you have to take a look at the best of the genre and judge it based on that. Now, if the best of the genre is still pretty bad, then fine, your argument may have some merit, but there are very few that fit that mold. And when when we talk about bad, we're not just talking about, "Oh, I don't like this particular series." No. I have a I have a very high standard for what is truly bad. Cuz even 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 when it even with the current punching bag that we ha that we have with with um, Black Clover, I can I can I can admit that that may be that that just may be a consequence of our own experience, because of how much anime we've seen. But somebody who is just getting into somebody who is just getting into anime or is or has of, or is um, or is a little bit experienced in the last few years, they might have they might have a different perspective on that, um, especially since. One um one YouTuber I follow, Rax the Hero, has been doing his own analysis videos throughout um Black Clover's run as the uh, manga. Um, and he and he and he's been enjoying that, and I've enjoyed his analyses on on the matter. So so someone is getting something out of it, but a truly bad work is where you're not getting anything from it. And those are a lot more rare than people would think. Yeah. Hell, you know, I mentioned Ben at the Sage earlier. Mm -hmm. And th this is coming from someone who did not used to like his videos. So this this should tell you how much I've learned, come to respect the man and the work he's done. Because for those who've never heard of the guy, look him up on YouTube. He looks at the schlockiest of the schlock in anime. I mean, this is a guy who reviewed MD Geist, if that tells you anything. Yeah, and I, st I still hate that movie. I still hate that movie. We all do. Mm -hmm. But he always takes the time to point out the good parts of a movie. And shows that even the worst of the worst in anime tend to have something to them. In fact, the outright quote-unquote bad aren't the problem. It's the boring, the repetitive, the stuff that adds nothing. That's the kind of shit you need to be avoiding. But you can find good merits out of even the schlockiest of bad anime. No, why do you think there's a whole culture about about riffing on bad movies? Yeah. Um. And that's. To the point that some somebody once somebody once said that I'd pro I'd probably torture them by making them watch Battlefield Earth. No, and I said, no. If I was gonna torture you with a movie, I'd make you watch Disney's Dinosaur. Yeah, something that's boring, not something that's bad. Because bad can be funny mm -hmm. if you're willing to just look past that. But when now I'd. When it comes to the when it comes to the current crop, I'd say I'd say that a genre that is dangerously close to needing a deconstruction might be isekai. Up I'm, until very recently, I would agree with you, mm -hmm. but I actually just recorded a video a review for an anime that does break away from the typical isekai tropes. Yeah. So it is. It, it. I think a lot of the studios are catching on that they need to change things up fast, 
or else they will become a target. Yeah, it was one of those things that's teetering on the edge because I was trying to think of a genre that might need a deconstruction in the future. Um, I know some people are. I know some people are saying Mecca. I I don't agree with that. Um, that Mecca doesn't need a deconstruction. It needs a fucking revival. Is what it needs. Yeah. <laughs> what I'd what I'd say what I. would if there, what I'd say is uh, what I'd say is honestly needed when it when it comes to Mecca is not a revival of of a, of traditional Gundam approach, but rather more, but rather a revival when it comes to the Super Robot approach, which we kind of had for a bit after Gurren Lagann, but it didn't last. Yeah. Now, actually, the more I think about it, there is one genre I can think of that might also be due might also be due for a deconstruction in the future, but it's a genre that you wouldn't normally think about when it comes to anime. What sports anime? Because I can think of I don't I can't think of any sports anime or anime that have a sports like uh, setup that don't follow the same exact formula every goddamn time. I would I would say now when it when it comes to when it comes to something like that, when it comes to something like that I honest I honestly think that with a lot of sports anime there's there's the issue of the creator not having a strong enough understanding of the of the sport that that is being based on um, there's also the, there's also the fact that it's it's really trick it's really kind of contradictory to to have an individual-based story within the confines of a team sport, like let I when it when it comes to whenever I whenever I'm asked about a of about about a type of sports anime that I that I'd actually get behind, the main one that comes to mind is The Prince of Tennis. In fact, it's the only one that comes to mind. Is Unless you're playing doubles, the you can you can do a singular focus story with with a series like that. But with other sports like say like say I Shield twenty I Shield twenty one with football or um or Slam Dunk with um ba- basketball. And I haven't seen the more recent I think it was High Q um, when it comes to when it comes to basketball. Um or 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 the various ones with baseball and you th- you'd think that Japan would get a decent baseball anime at this point <laughs> you would think but the problem is all of those are te- are team sports and it's hard to do an individual story within within that and it's especially hard to do that in the span in the span of an entire season yeah and before any of you go bringing up Yuri on Ice that is not a sports anime. It's just in the guise of one. Yeah. <laughs> and when it co- and I would I if somebody were to ask me how I would how I would do that kind of thing, the first thing that the first I thing that I would do that they're not athletes. <laughs> That's not the point I was trying to make, dear. Sorry, Lady <laughs> K had to put her two cents in. Yeah. And don't say figure skating isn't a fucking sport. No, that's not it's I'm saying Yuri and Ice is a romance anime in the guise of a sports anime. Not that higher gear skating is a sport. That wasn't the point I was making. Mm-hmm. <sighs> I love my wife. Sometimes I really do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh boy. You better love me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> We're breaking the first rule of television. We're talking to people who aren't on screen, even though it's not television. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I will. I will point. Even even now, the whole debate about whether whether or not whether or not it is a um, whether or not it is a sport. Even even with that, the problem is when it comes to when it comes to a lot of when it comes to a lot of those, these particular shows. They never the the sport part of it ends up being kind of inconsequential. And when you compare that to the mechanics that are expressed in other, in other shonen work, that's where problems start. That's where problems start to arise. And even, and this is going to sound a bit strange, but um, Yu-Gi-Oh ends up being a better sports anime than some of them. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, because the game ends up being the centerpiece of everything. Yeah. You know, everything revolves around the game. Whereas when you look at most quote unquote sports anime, they all follow the same formula. You could literally stick any sport into them and it would still work because it's all the exact same story. It's all about the team itself, not about the sport. Sure, they'll make it seem like it's about the sport with all the stats and all the tactics and mechanics. But when you really look at the overall story, it's the exact same fucking thing over and over again. And I know somebody might say that you can't, that you can't do that without, uh, without overcomplicating things. I, d I disagree. Um, I want to point out a couple of YouTube channels that I, that I follow on this. Now, first off, there's the king of sports shit posting in urinating tree, but I also, but for the purpose of this, I want to focus on the more documentary style videos that were done by people like um, Set the Edge and the QB School. Within within their particular work, I the reason why I ended up getting back into football because because of YouTubers like this is. Through, through their works and through the works of some other YouTubers, I was able to get an understanding of the real chess match that really, that really goes on with how all the moving parts move within, within a given game. Um, and to that, to that end, I'd also say that, the, that, pro that, possibly, the be that possibly the best use of, a, of sport in a, in a sport's work um, might be Akagi. <laughs> which is which is all about reach mahjong and it goes into detail about it and the reason why i think this detail is important now cons now i'm going to use naruto as my as my example for this and i know some people might eye roll but trust me i'm going somewhere with this within the first few story beats of naruto you understand the nature of ninjas what they do, how they operate, how their powers work, and what limitations they have. What do, if I was if I was watching Yuri on Ice? What about what about what would what within it does it explain about how figure skating works? If I'm watching Ice Shield 21, what in it goes into detail about how football works. You see the problem? And this is why I say that if there's any genre of anime that is due for a deconstruction, it's sports anime. Because people need to, you, you need to break that down and make people realize that it's all the fucking same so that other companies can say, yeah, we probably could do to actually focus on the game instead of just the whole team building aspect because really they're just slice of life anime, yeah. just not, with a sport attached. I'm not saying that the team building aspect isn't isn't important, but that but um the but if you're going to do a sport anime, you de you do need to put that in focus and um I would and um if if somebody if somebody was saying that they wanted to do a a a um, shonen manga based on um, football. The first thing that I'd probably do is is say is say hey you hey you want to hey you want to come to US Bank Stadium for a few weeks. You know and let them actually let them actually see how it works. Let them wa let them watch a bunch of film. Especially especially since people essentially since people who analyze have to have a bit and even people who play have to have an obsession for every little detail about the sport. And also, also, as a bit of an aside, that's the reason why the whole pro bending thing in in uh, Legend of Korra fell on its face. <clears throat> the uh, it ult it ultimately comes and when it comes to when it comes to people say, saying that that would that doing that would overcomplicate things because you'd be ex you'd effectively be explaining the sports to a non sports audience. If it's done properly, you can make that into a gateway. Yeah, which is kind of the whole point to begin with. Mm -hmm. So, with that, in, with that in mind, while it might, 
Well, the idea of having a having a deconstruction with sports with sports anime might seem a bit might seem a bit um, of a stretch. There actually was an instance of a of a deconstructive look when it came to sports films some years back. I'm not sure if you saw it, but have you ever heard of Moneyball? No. That now that now that's that started Brad Pitt. That was um, I think that was early two thousands. No, it, was, it wasn't early 2000s. It was, I think, early 2010s. I'll have to take a look. But that particular film did not present itself in the way a typical sports movie might, with the action beats and the whole and the whole getting the team together and all that. It was more. It was more about the the um re- the way the Oakland A's in the in the early 2000s revolutionized how team building worked by effectively disregarding. The typical, um, uh, the typical intent glorified intangibles that scouts relied on up to that point, and that w- that was the ma- that was the major conflict within it. It was, it was less it was less about the sport and more about cha- and more about attacking um, traditions that weren't going to work. Especially since, keep in mind the a- the reason why they ended up doing that in the first place is that Oakland was a small market team, and they and they weren't going to have the amount of money to get to get the top flight players. So it was more about trying to build the best team that they, that could be done with pe- with people who were considered bottom of the barrel or cheap or in decline. And actually, no, oh, sorry, go ahead. If it can be if it can be done in film. Then I see no reason why it can't be done in anime. And on another, on another, on another direction, you know, we were talking earlier about you know how we could explain the stats and everything like that, and, and really get into an educational vibe with it and actually explain the game. I can think of another anime that did something a bit similar in a different genre and a different whole field altogether. Food Wars. An anime, huh? Food Wars. No. No, that is a close second. An anime that was purely about its education of the material, but did it in a way that was entertaining and did it in a way that was, you know, it made the education the focus while not taking away from the fun. Cells at work. That's a very good, that's a very good point. And we are, we are in... This might be a topic for this might be a topic we can delve into another day, but we are in a, we are in a bit of a trend of of these educational style anime that don't feel like the educational ser- um, style pejorative. Between yeah, between that's... that between between how heavy are the dumbbells you lift or or um, food wars or even um, Doctor Stone. We do have we. I'm not. I'm not saying that that. I'm not saying that's become a full on trend, but it has become. But there have been enough instances of it of it to become a pattern. Yeah, and notice all aside from maybe dumbbells, which is a good series. It just never quite picked up steam as good as it was. All the other three were all massive successes. We're talking talk of the town in the anime community. Mm-hmm. You couldn't turn a you, you couldn't turn a corner in the anime community while hearing somebody talking about at least one of those three series, if not all of them. Although Food Wars was certainly helped by um, a certain running gag, <laughs> which is funny because the more I think about it, the more that gag didn't play out in the long run. Sure, they do have the food gasm scenes, and as the series goes on, but they were a, a lot less pronounced as that initial first episode had because we've watched what two seasons of that Mm -hmm. and it didn't have much of them and they the ones that came after that first one weren't nearly as sexual yeah and when it when it comes to and because of that i all, all that combines to the fact that there is no reason why this can't this can't be done with um with sports. Hell, um. Hell, you could you could probably you could pr- 
Hell, um, you already have you already have it gift wrapped to you in the case of Formula One racing. Because first off, you already have you already have a racing culture with with stuff like Initial D, and I can hear the Eurobeat in the background. Not your background. <laughs> no, no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And that and that show and that show was helped by the fact that the guy behind it is a genuine gearhead, which only only further drives home my point. When it comes to, but I recently I recently came across I recently um about a year ago, which doesn't really count much for recent, but. There was a there was a series on Netflix called F1 Drive to Survive. And it was and it was kind of a documentary style series that really went into a lot of storylines involving that particular F1 season. In particular some of the storylines involving Ferrari. Because because and um through something like that and through the car culture that there already is on on some levels in parts of Japan. You've got enough to have a to have a foundation where you where you can you can make plenty of stories about people just who are just driven to be the best. And even and in addition to that, there's there's there are there are so, there are so many different documentaries of different eras, rivalries, feuds it, and so on within sports that at least I think at least a 12 episode anime could be made out of one of them. Well, I'd love I'd love to see somebody do an anime interpretation of the um of the good old fashioned hate rivalry in certain college sports. Um The point the point is is that the material is there. It just has it just has to be it just has to be grasped by someone. So I and the I know thing, I think the biggest thing about this is it Focus less on what studio is making. You can have the best studio. You can have Production IG or Studio Madhouse or even Trigger doing it. Mm -hmm. The prob the thing you have to focus on is getting someone to write and produce this anime who have a passion for whatever it is you're talking about. If you're doing a racing anime, you have to have someone who is passionate about racing. Have a full-on gearhead like you mentioned earlier. You're gonna do a football anime. You get somebody who knows everything about American football down to the down to the finest detail, down to every single stat of every player they can think of. You have to get somebody who understands that sport in every way because they're the ones who are going to carry that into their writing. I'll tell I'll tell you a little story about how about how I um how I ended up delving deep into into um Sailor Moon and. Part of this won't surprise you, but part of it does ha does have a bit of a lineage to it. Um, as you know, for years I I ran a kind of a semi school to teach people how to play role playing games. Now I was I was asked by a friend of a friend if I would be willing to run a Sailor Moon campaign because th because they had gotten a hold they had gotten a hold of the RPG and resource book from Guardians of Order. And I, at that time, I had seen a handful of episodes here, here and there during the Deke era, but I never, but I never really went further into it. But since I was going to be tackling it, I couldn't rely on just my knowledge from that. That that was several years old at that point. So I went out of my way to to essentially binge watch the whole damn series, from the original season all the way up to Stars and the live action material. Um, it was get, it was several years before Crystal had, co had come out, so obviously I couldn't use that. And the reason I did that is because Harv Bennett did that exact same thing when he stepped on to be producer for Wrath of Khan. At when he stepped when he took the job, he hadn't seen a single episode of Star Trek, so he binged watched the whole series. And when and I th and. When you're do when you're doing research on a on a given topic to do a story, I do think you need to do that kind of thing. Um, Liam Hearn, when she was writing Otori, she spent like eleven years in and out of Kyoto. 
and that was the experiences that she that she based her her um, writing on. She was in Kyoto, and she was in ver in various basically the sticks outside outside of Kyoto. Getting the full experience, mm -hmm. not just the basics. Yeah. And I th and I think that I think that's something that's definitely important. I th another another anime that ki that kind of goes into that that kind of proves our point with the whole research thing. You remember Gunsmith Cats? Oh yeah. Yeah the cr the creator of that series was was a uh, gu was a gun nut themselves and w and did and ever since that series has been praised for how it ha for how it handles firearms. Even with some of the ridiculous parts, like having way too many grenades, <laughs> which um, I don't, which is only a, which I only bring up simply because every time I see that amount of grenades, I end up getting Vietnam flashbacks to my times playing the good Call of Duty games on the hardest difficulty. Nade spam for days. And nade spams with really short fuses, so you can so by the time you notice that there's a grenade on the ground, it's too late. Yeah, this is why nobody plays Call of Duty on Veteran. <laughs> but I do, th I do think that's some the other. Um, I suppose. As a final note, the other genre I've seen some people argue could you could use this kind of treatment is is um harem, but um harem's ca harem isn't isn't really a isn't as much of a thing anymore. Harem slash light. No. It's it's kind of just it's kind of phased itself out. It's I wouldn't even say phased itself. I, I would say it's more blended into other genres and and done other things with it and. Even at its peak, harem had already kind of branched itself out in different directions. Sure, you could say there was a lot of different, a lot of the same tropes, but even then, it's eh, I wouldn't exactly call it something that ever needed deconstruction. And whenever I see, whenever I see people try and deconstruct it, there's always that air of um, cynicism that I mentioned with trying to deconstruct something like shonen. I think that's the general problem with with people wanting to deconstruct in, uh, as a whole is that they don't want to deconstruct. They want to they want to satire. Going back to the power slash rangers thing we talked about earlier, that the people don't want a deconstruction because to do a proper deconstruction, you have to have an appreciation for the genre, but see that there's more that it can be done with. It. If you're not, if you don't appreciate the genre, then you're not deconstructing it. You're satirizing it. Even even with the whole satire thing, the the big the big problem is a lot is in a lot of in a lot of those cases, they do, they um they don't ha they don't have they be, they have an outright disdain for the genre when when it comes to satiring. Um, I know that's obviously the case with Power Slash Rangers. He doesn't he didn't care for the source material, and he outright said so. But a lot of other cases, you you it feels like a glorified take that to to the to the source material, or just or just um, being butthurt that that's what people are focusing on and not what you want to focus on. In other words, fucking hipsters. Now I have no time <laughs> for hipsters. No. Yeah, but a proper deconstruction comes from somebody that respects the genre, which is why I go go. Let's bring it all the way back to Monica. You know, even if. Gen or Obuchi didn't have his didn't have the same appreciation. We know Shinbo did because he's done that kind of work before. So he understood the genre. He appreciated the genre and wanted to see more out of it. And he started that by helping out with Nana with Nanaha. Mm -hmm. And then he took it to the next level by doing Madoka. Yeah. And that's why it worked when any other kind of deconstruction, like we'll say Yuki Yuna, failed. And that's and that's going to and that's going to be that's going to be um that's going that's that's going to be a lesson that some people won't learn and when they don't learn it they will have they will deal with very painful consequences after the fact. Um 
And I I know some, I know somebody might say, well, what what about that whole dungeons and deconstruction thing that you're working on? Um, I have with that with that particular project, which is which is um in the scripting phase. I will note, and it's something that it's something that you're not going to see for I wouldn't you're probably not going to see that until 2021 at the um, earliest. That is that is me. Exam examining the, examining certain tr certain cliches and certain tropes within Dungeons and Dragons and what doesn't mesh. And I have made I have made very clear that D and D has had a tradition problem for over twenty years, so it's not like this is off base for me. And while I haven't been playing D and D for that long, I've I have played I have played at least one session of every. It, every iteration of every edition, all of the all of the variants of first edition, and and going on, and going on from there. So I think I have I think I qualify for having an appreciation. But there are th but there are things that I think do need to be addressed that haven't been addressed enough. Because of because of the whole tradition thing. And it ulti it ultimately come it ultimately comes down to to it. You um you can't be you can't have too much pride in the matter. After all, pride always comes before a fall. Mm hmm But I think I think we'll leave I think we'll leave it off at that. We'll be we'll be back here next week with a with a different with a different matter that may or may not go into deep lore. Depending on depending on where the wheel spins, <laughs> um, but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk, and join the watch. Good night, everybody. <laughs>